In this video, we're going to go over the fundamentals of mushroom biology. Whether you're a forager, cultivator, or just a mushroom enthusiast, this knowledge will give you a strong foundation for your mycological pursuits. We're going to dive into the diverse and exciting world of fungal biology by answering these questions. What is a fungus? How do fungi grow in their environment? And what role do mushrooms play in the fungal life cycle? Scientists are experimenting with green plants to find out why chlorophyll is so important. They have discovered that plants without chlorophyll, such as the fungi, cannot make food for themselves. They must get their food from plants with green leaves. Historically, naturalists thought of mushrooms as a type of mysterious plant that didn't need sunlight and could grow almost miraculously overnight. This legacy can still be seen today in the fact that until recently, most mycology departments were housed within botany departments. And many terms used for mushrooms are actually borrowed from plant terminology. Over the years, researchers realized how different mushrooms were from plants. And in 1969, scientists elevated mushrooms to their own kingdom, the fungal kingdom. We can see that the fungal kingdom is distinct from both plants and animals, and that in fact is more closely related to animals than plants. In some ways, this history is symbolic of how little we know about fungi and how young the field of modern mycology is. That mushroom you find in the woods might be new to science, and we are still figuring out how to cultivate the vast majority of edible mushroom species. So what is a fungus anyways? As we just saw, fungi make up their own distinct kingdom that is separate from plants and animals. In order for us to demonstrate what a fungus is biologically, we're calling on our cohabitants in neighboring kingdoms to help us compare both the macro and micro distinctions between fungi, plants, and animals. Let's start by demonstrating a few of the major differences between them. As we all know, animals can independently move throughout their environment whereas both plants and fungi can't, and instead grow throughout their environment as a response to outside stimulus. For example, imagine a bright light in an otherwise dark room. A moth would be able to fly towards that bright light, whereas a plant or fungus would need to grow towards it. Although all these organisms react to the light, the way in which they are capable of doing so is different. Speaking of light, a major difference between these organisms is that plants are able to produce their own energy with sugars made from the sun during photosynthesis. This is called being autotrophic, or producing one's own energy. Animals and fungi lack this ability and need to consume other material to get energy. This is called being heterotrophic, though the way they get their energy differs. Animals ingest their food and then digest it, meaning they bring the food into their body before digestion. Fungi, on the other hand, digest, then ingest their food, meaning they secrete digestive enzymes outside of their bodies into the environment and then absorb the digested compounds. To put it in human terms, imagine eating food by first vomiting on it, allowing it to digest outside of your body, and then sucking up the remaining nutrient slurry through your fingers. Another difference is that both animals and plants have vascular systems. These are specialized systems for transporting fluids. In animals, this is the circulatory system of blood vessels, veins, and hearts. In plants, it's the xylem and phloem inside the stems, branches, and roots. Fungi, on the other hand, don't have any tissue for the transport of fluids, and instead rely on streaming between cells to move fluids and nutrients around. Another attribute of fungi is that they reproduce through spores. These are single cells that are often dispersed through the air, though not always, and are capable of growing into an individual without the need for fusion. 
Animals don't use spores, and only some varieties of plants, such as ferns, rely on spores to reproduce. Animals, plants, and fungi are also distinguished by their life cycles. Though we are most familiar with the life cycle of animals, fungi have a more complex life cycle that involves something called an alternation of generations. This means the life cycle involves two distinct organisms that represent different phases of the same life cycle. There's also a variety of microscopic and chemical differences between fungi, plants, and animals. Some of the most noticeable ones can be seen when looking at the cells of these different groups. You can see that both plants and fungi have cell walls, whereas animals do not. But then within plants, the cell walls are made up of cellulose, while in fungi, they are made up of chitin. But there's one more feature of the fungal kingdom that we haven't discussed yet. Let's head over to the laboratory to get a closer look. Perhaps the most defining feature of the fungal kingdom is that they grow in long chains of cells called hyphae. These hyphae not only make up mushrooms you're familiar with seeing in the grocery store or woods, but they also make up the primary feeding structure of the organism, which you often don't see because it exists in the soil or material the mushrooms are growing from. In this case, this mushroom is growing from a block of sawdust, and you can see both the mushroom and the fungal hyphae, which is visible as this white material. With a microscope, we can look closer at the substrate and see this collection of hyphae, which is also known as mycelium. As the primary feeding structure, mycelium grows throughout the mushroom's food source, all the while secreting digestive enzymes that break down the material and allow the mycelium to absorb the unlocked nutrients. This ability of hyphae to grow through material, in conjunction with the fact that fungi don't need sunlight, allows them to be omnipresent in our environment, inhabiting a wide range of ecological niches. Many mushrooms you find in the woods are considered culinary delicacies. Fungal yeasts and some particular molds are essential in producing bread, alcohol, and cheeses. At the same time, fungi could be considered our greatest competitor for food. That's fungi outcompeting you for the same resource. As decomposers, fungi play a pivotal role in nutrient cycling, especially in terrestrial ecosystems where many of the habitats we have today would not exist without fungi. In the same breath, Fungal pathogens can have profound negative impacts on ecosystems, with many recent species die-offs resulting from fungi, such as chestnut blight, white-nose syndrome of bats, chytridiomycosis of frogs. Yet fungi also form intimate relationships with other organisms that can be both positive, such as mycorrhizal or endophytic fungi found in plants around the world, or negative, such as athlete's foot and yeast infections. This huge range of diversity is all possible because of the unique attributes of fungal hyphae. Let's take an even closer cellular look at how hyphae functions. We can see the chain of cells that make up fungal hyphae. The separation between cells is called a septum. Some fungi have very complex septa, some have simple septa, and others have no septation at all. Let's get even closer and take a look at the cellular processes of the fungal hypha. We can see that the fungal hypha has many of the same structures that plant and animal cells have. There's the cell wall that gives rigidity to fungal cells. The cell membrane, a semi-permeable structure that regulates the flow of contents in and out of the cells. Organelles such as the mitochondria, the power plant of the cell, the Golgi apparatus that facilitates the packaging and movement of cell contents and enzymes. And of course, the nuclei, where the genetic material is contained. 
A unique feature of fungal cells is this dense cluster of vesicles at the tip of the hyphae called the spitzenkorper. As the hyphae grows, these vesicles migrate towards the tip, fusing with the cell membrane and dumping digestive enzymes into the environment. As this process happens, the vesicles are simultaneously adding more membrane material to the hyphal tip, allowing it to elongate into the space created by the enzymes, digesting whatever material the mushroom mycelium is growing through. Imagine, if you will, a raindrop containing a single speck of dirt falling into a puddle on the sidewalk. As the raindrop hits the puddle, it not only deposits the speck of dirt into it, but adds to and fuses entirely with the puddle. In this way, the vesicles simultaneously accomplish three things. They deposit enzymes into the environment, add membrane to the growing hyphal tip, and create space ahead of the growing hypha. Now that we understand what the fungal hypha is, we can better understand the complete mushroom life cycle. A life cycle is defined as a series of changes that a species undergoes as it passes through the beginning of life towards the reproduction of the next generation. Within the fungal kingdom, there's a large diversity of fungal groups that have a variety of different life cycles. From the ubiquitous asexual mold species you might find growing on a loaf of bread, to the mushroom species we find growing in the woods. In order to demonstrate the life cycle, we're going to take a closer look at one of the mushrooms we're most familiar with, specifically shiitake, which exemplifies the life cycle of the Basidiomycota, the group containing the majority of large fleshy fungi. Let's start by going over the anatomy of a mushroom. This part of a mushroom is called the cap, or pileus, and is supported by the stem, or stipe. Below the stem, we can see the mushroom mycelium growing underneath the bark of the log. With the shiitake, under the cap, you can see gills. This is the part of the mushroom where spores are produced, also referred to as the hymenium. In some mushroom species, the spore-bearing surface will look different. Some can be smooth, have teeth, or pores. The function of all these different structures is to increase the surface area on which spores can be produced. One way to think about it is that a mushroom is analogous to an apple on an apple tree. The purpose of an apple is to spread seeds and create the next generation, but the main part of the life cycle that continues growing year after year is the tree itself. Similarly, in fungi, the mushroom has the sole purpose of making and dispersing spores, but the predominant part of the life cycle that grows throughout the environment year after year is actually the mycelium. A mushroom can produce as many as a billion spores each day, with certain species ejecting spores at a record-breaking velocity of 1.8 million meters per second. Other fungi can even create their own currents of air to aid in spore dispersal. There's a huge range of different methods that fungi use to spread their spores, but these methods are trying to accomplish the same thing to get spores out into the environment and find a suitable place to land, germinate, and form a single hypha. At this stage of the life cycle, the single spore and hyphae that it produces only has half of the genetic material it needs to complete the life cycle. We refer to the hyphae in this stage as being haploid and monokaryotic. It's also the first generation in the alternation of generations that we referred to back in the laboratory. This haploid hypha grows throughout the environment, and if it is fortunate, will encounter another compatible haploid hypha from the same species. At this point, the two hyphae fuse to create a new mycelium that now has all the genetic material it needs to produce a mushroom. This stage of the life cycle is unique to fungi because even though the cell contents fuse, the nuclei do not. The nuclei stay separate. This is called a dikaryon, or dikaryotic mycelium, and is the second generation in the alternation of generations. 
This mycelium that now has all the genetic material it needs continues to grow throughout the environment, digesting its substrate. Once the mycelium has amassed enough nutrients and the environmental conditions are right, it will produce mushrooms to start the life cycle again. If we look closely at our mushroom here, we can see that all of the mushroom tissue are made up of this dikaryotic mycelium. In the hymenium, we can see each strand of mycelium terminates in a specialized cell called a basidium. It is in this cell where the two nuclei fuse to produce a diploid immediately before dividing into four new haploid spores. It is interesting to note that humans spend their lives as a diploid organism, whereas in fungi, this stage of the life cycle happens in the blink of an eye. It's our hope that this foundational knowledge on the history of mycology, how fungi differ from other kingdoms, the unique structure of fungal hyphae, and the life cycle of fungi is just the beginning of your mycological pursuits. <laughs>